Welcome to Valley's Gold, a show where we explore the people and places who feed and clothe us. On this episode, we seek out some of California's more unusual crops and characters. From plants that you've likely never heard of to the world's most expressive farm animals, we'll show you a different side of the ag industry. Please join me, Ryan Jacobson, on this adventure. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources Valley Agriculture, and Native Wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our table. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture. We begin our journey in a field of a once forgotten California crop, hops. Due to the revolution of microbreweries, locally grown hops are growing in demand. We have been joined by Grant Parnagian to show us how this distinctive crop is grown. That's why I'm excited to be here because I think this is one of the coolest things going on in the valley. But before I jump to that, tell me about your family's rich legacy in California agriculture. Yeah, well, uh, my grandfather Sam started uh, the company Fowler Packing uh, in the 1950s. Uh, we grew in tree fruit and then into table grapes. And now we've transitioned into uh, mandarins, uh, almonds, and pistachios, and now hops. And now hops. And that's why I'm here to talk to you because this is something that's not unique just to the valley, but unique to California. What is, let's start with what is hops? Well, hops are the main ingredients that brewers uh, use to make beer. And uh, there's a lot of different types of, of hops uh, and brewers use them in different ways to add flavor and aroma to their beer. Craft beer is exploding in popularity and microbreweries are using these California grown hops to create a variety of unique flavors. They look like little mini pine cones but it's not that green that you're going after, it's you opening it up to get that yellow pollen in the inside. Yeah, what it is, it's, it's called lupulin, it's the, uh, the yellow uh, oils that are in, inside of the cones here, and that's what the, the, the brewing value uh, is of the hops. Got it. What we're looking at is one of the only commercial operations we have in California. That's correct, as far as I, I know, this is the only commercial hop yard in California. California was once a major producer of hops, but due to pest issues, the industry shifted primarily to Oregon and Washington. And now, uh, probably close to 90% of the world's hops uh, comes from the Pacific Northwest. And here we are on a San Joaquin Valley day when I think the high is gonna reach 108. How are you doing that here? They are, they are actually growing here? Yeah, they are growing, as you can see, quite well. Obviously, we've got uh, five different varieties here. We've got a total of 10 acres, uh, two acres of each variety. And uh, we're learning that each variety has its own different characteristics. So we're learning how to, to farm them uh, differently to get the max production uh, that we can out of them. A lot of our uh, practices that we have as far as the irrigation that we implement, uh, we're able to maybe uh, cool the plants down a little bit. Got it. But the best way to explain this as a perennial crop, it's a rhizome. So you're really growing a massive roots underneath the ground, but every year that plant is gonna come back from that root zone. The plant does come back. It'll go dormant in, 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 in the fall, late fall and the winter time. Uh, the leaves will die back and whatever matter that you have on the, on, on the crown of the plant, you eliminate and uh, you just maybe kick a mound of dirt over the, over the top. Hops is a perennial crop. It will go dormant in late fall and begin to grow in early spring. 
This is mid-July, so these things grow very exponentially fast. Yeah, I mean, these things will grow anywhere from, you know, six, what, I, what I've what i noticed and measured, you know, anywhere between, you know, four to eight inches uh, oh, wow. a day. A day, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then one thing that I found really intriguing, I thought this was a fun fact for our viewers out there, is that these things climb the rope counterclockwise. Explain why. That's correct. They grow counterclockwise because they follow the the movement of the sun. Got it. So, okay. I mean, you can you can literally stand out here and, and come out in the morning and just see them twisting around, twisting around the tree. Once they grab onto the twine, I mean it's they're they're there and they they'll they'll start to grow. Hops are grown using a very large trellis system that can stand over 18 feet tall. So what we do is. Uh, we have the guide wire up on top of the trellis system uh, that stays there permanently, and then every year we have to restring it. You cut the string at the bottom first, yeah. and then you come uh, with the man lift and you cut the tops, and then you, you, you place the whole vine uh, on the trailer and we take it to the yard to harvest. The harvested vines are placed into a machine that removes the cones from the stems and leaves. The cones are then transported to a facility where they are dried utilizing heaters and fans. As we uh, harvest them, uh, m the majority of the brewers like them in pellet form, so we'll, we'll take them to our facility, dry them down between 8 and 10 percent moisture, and then pelletize them from there. The dried hops are loaded into the pelletizer, which utilizes a die and roller to compress the cones into a tubular shape. The pellets are then vacuum sealed for preservation and shipping. I know you're proud to have this California grown product right here out of Fresno. Where will your products end up? You know what, hopefully our products will end up, uh, obviously I want to, my main focus right now is to get it to the local breweries here in the Central Valley. Uh, I want to make sure it's a good product, something that they're uh, confident and happy using, and then, then grow from there. And Grant, for our viewers that want to learn more, they can visit your website, but also find you guys on social media. Yeah, that's correct. If they want to follow us and kind of see what we're doing, I try and update it as much as I can uh, just to give the, the people that go to the sites kind of uh, an inside view of what's going on at, at, the, at the hop yard. So, yeah, if they want to follow us, they can go to our website, goldenstatehops.com, uh, or go to our Instagram page uh, or, or the Facebook page. Got it. Well, Grant, this has been a special treat coming out here. This is a crop that so many of our viewers, I know they know about hops, and we all know where hops are used, but very few people get to see it grown and most importantly, California grown. So thanks for having me out here today. Well, thank you for coming out, Ryan. Yes, we, we, we're very proud to say that these are locally grown California hops for any, any brewer that would like to use them. Well, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Uh, March, March, yeah, I uh, picking. March or April, you're already picking? Yeah, March, April. Because oh. I uh, cover earlier than I pick in earlier too. You pick earlier, okay, yeah. wow, okay. And that's one thing that I thought was really unusual is looking at the plant after you harvested it, there's still a tree there and it just keeps growing so you got more to harvest later. Yeah. Tell me, how many times through the summer can you harvest a plant? Uh, Until the winter comes. Until winter comes, you just yeah. keep? You just keep harvesting, uh, yeah. harvest every day. Moringa plants are harvested until first frost. As our viewers can probably see, we're sweating. It's, I mean, we're here in a oh, yeah. very hot summer day. It's gonna be over 100 degrees a day, but uh, this plant seems to be very thriving here in, these, um, in, in this the environment. In the Valley, this is perfect environment for this, this kind of plant. As you see here, the Moringa, it, uh, they use it uh, for its uh, high um, uh, level of proteins, uh, minerals, and vitamins. Oh, wow, okay. Moringa is considered by many to be a superfood because of its rich protein, vitamin, and mineral makeup. It really is the next superfood. Oh yes, yes, uh, it will be. It will be the next superfood. <laughs> and so that leads me to, how do you eat it? Well, you know, you can um, you know, use it uh, dry or fresh leaf for your salad, uh, your, your, uh, your energy bar, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, smoothie, etc. Moringa is an important food in certain parts of the world, utilized in such foods as teas, puddings, salad dressings, soups, dips, sauces, and even ice cream. It has been used by some cultures for medicinal purposes for thousands of years. And is this something that is highly consumed in other countries? Uh, yes, in uh, India and in Africa, and uh, usually people don't know about it, they uh, import it, but uh, you know, now we have it here. Fresh. It's something we can grow here locally, locally here, in the, yep, yes. here in the San Joaquin Valley. Well, Dirksen and Michael, thank you so much for informing me about this wonderful new crop that, again, I was so surprised to get that flavor and that taste from a big tree, what it looks like. And so it's definitely something distinctive here in the San Joaquin Valley. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it, thank you for having me out on your farm. We have traveled to a remarkable place, the Lufa Farm on California's central coast to learn about a crop that looks out of this world. We have been joined by Deanne Kuhn. I'm excited to learn about this incredible place. Tell me about the Lufa Farm. Well, it actually started as a hobby, and I realized the more and more I grew the loofahs, more and more they had an attitude, not everybody can grow a loofah. I moved here like 18 years ago. I really realized I landed in paradise, and I didn't want to go get a full-time job. Okay. <laughs> I actually thought that if I get the loofahs to grow and like Napomo and still like me, I'd go to little marketplaces and just start a little like Avon route. <laughs> but best laid plans, not everything works out like you think. Um, my label said, grown in Napomo in the California sunshine across from the golf course. 18 years ago, there was one golf course. People just started coming up the driveway. They were getting out of the cars with beach towels, bags of snorkel equipment, and asking me what time my shuttle's leaving. There's a lot of people that think loofahs come from the sea. You say the word sponge, and that's where your brain comes <laughs> Sponges do grow in the ocean, but loofah sponges are grown on the vine. And I tell these people, no, 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 there's no shuttle. Put your beach towels back. Put your uh, snorkel equipment back. Come on, I'll show you. And they came, and I had no idea about the power of word of mouth. Yeah. They went and told people that told other people that told other people. And that's how I found you, because it really is a novelty. But before I jump to how you grow the loofah, you have a little bit more than just loofahs here, too. You do a lot of other stuff. We really try to remind the children of today's era that not everything comes from a medicine cabinet, not everything has to come from a doctor, and that most likely even their elders actually grew things that kept them healthy. So yeah. we really like, before a customer leaves, they know a little bit about peppermint spearmint, what they call the old-fashioned backyard herbs. And you had me try one that I thought was unique because I hadn't heard it. Chocolate mint? Chocolate mint. Fresh as you can get, <laughs> and yes. It has that chocolate aroma to it. Yep, it definitely does. Lufas are tropical and subtropical vines that are part of the cucumber family. 
greenhouses help them thrive. Well, I'm here to learn about loofahs. So you have them in hot houses over here, and I think that's probably deservingly so because there can be little weather fluctuations over here, and they probably do very well in those hot houses. They do. They like the heat, but they really don't need to have as much heat as the greenhouses Got it. Um, develop. But um, they just they flourish here. They really, really like the attention that they get here. Yeah, and so you have them in containers or pots right. that are then irrigated, looks like, through drip irrigation. Going, yeah. And how long does it take from seed to production time? If it likes you, you plant after the first frost and you harvest before the first frost. Okay. And usually about three months in the in its environment, it'll start showing a loofah. Yeah. If it gets knocked off the vine, it'll just go to rot. If it hangs too close to one it doesn't like, one will shrivel up and the other one will thrive. The major stages of the loofah are the yellow flower, the green gourd, and finally, the brown sponge. Explain it all to me. Well, this is a growing one, and it's only gonna grow what it thinks it can hold on to attached to the vine. Okay. And then once it gets to the weight that it thinks it can hold, it'll start going through a different stage, such as the yellowing. And what it's doing is drawing up all the moisture. It's refeeding every loofah that's on this guy's wow. vine. Okay. While it does that, it sucks it up. It changes it from that dark, heavy green to the lighter yellowish. And then it actually will brown right here on the vine. Oh, you're going to harvest one for it. We'll go ahead and cut this guy. Oh, you, you got seeds it. falling out. Yep. To the bottom there. Feel the lightweight compared to the... Yeah. The heavy one there. Oh, wow. So That's got to be, what, 90% water, I'm assuming, is. or close to it. And then on these guys, you can just simply shake it and loosen up all the seeds. And it's quirky. This guy has, it's a nice size loofah. It has lots of seeds. However, one that's half its size can have double the amount of seeds. seeds. It's like raising kids, tall ones, short ones. They all come to the same parents, but they're all totally different. And with the loofah, you can simply peel it. And our loofahs are soft. They're inviting, much unlike any other loofahs. Yep. And you didn't have to go under the ocean to try to find this one. This is true. <laughs> The loofah can be rather difficult to peel, but there are techniques to speeding up the process. Talk about the process of peeling those. Is there a secret to them? Because we some do. of them can be a little bit difficult. We do. We, we actually tell the families that visit, if you got a kid that needs some you know, discipline, come on, we'll, we'll, let them, we'll let them pick and peel a whole bunch of them. But we do have tricks of the trade. We go ahead and we beat the seeds all out. We have kitty plastic swimming pools. Okay. We soak them all in there, and then usually one of the grandkids will peel them all for us, put them through the washing machine, back out in the sunshine, and they're done. That's great. And everything that you're distributing, is or is it going through the storefront here, or do you have... We other have places. A website, but okay. Most of it's a good old fashioned word of mouth. And so, how can visitors come check this place out? Whether you're going north on the 101 or south on the 101, there's the Willow Road off ramp, three miles back towards the ocean on the left hand side. And this is a place I'm encouraging everybody to come to Perfect. see. It's a gorgeous day, and I need to mention it is the middle of summer right now. It's about 103, I think, is the expected high over in the valley today. And here we are, gorgeous, I think mid 60s right now. So, it feels, right. feels wonderful. The sun's shining. And as you said, there's so much to see more than loofahs, but the loofahs are worth it by themselves. That's true. Well, Deanne, thank you so much for having us out to see one of the very few places to come see loofahs grown in the USA. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. We are ending our episode in San Luis Obispo with several unforgettable characters and their funny creator, Lee Rubin of Rube's Cartoons. What the heck is a comic strip writer? A comic strip writer is a person that writes comic strips that appear in your newspaper 365 days a year. And if you're not laughing, I'm not doing my job. You're going to make me laugh during this interview? I hope so. <laughs> not, do you have a laugh track you can throw in? Absolutely. We might have to do that. Well, tell me about Rubes. Uh, Rubes is a, the daily cartoon I've been drawing since uh, 1984, so there's uh, well over 12,000 of them by now. Oh, wow. I think. And I have them all in my super secret <laughs> storage uh, facility. Uh, and all of them are for sale, in, just in case. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! So twelve thousand <laughs> comic strips—that's a whole lot of them. It is. Three hundred sixty-five days a year. How do you come up with these ideas? Uh, I read a lot. I dream a lot. I take naps a lot. I sketch <laughs> a lot. Uh, and I am surrounded by a lot of inspiration, whether it's from my family or animals. And that was my question. Like, you really have a love for animals, but that's because they are a great suit in or a fit in there. So exactly. I mean, you can't, you can use udders much easier than you can use the human equivalent. I got it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Okay. 
When did you start writing comic strips? Well, the very, very first one ever was in kindergarten. Lee shows us his first drawing. This was in kindergarten a long time ago. So what I, I was given a piece of paper. So th what this is going to represent is both sides of the piece of paper. And I drew a giant that was so big that I had to, had to put his uh, head on the other side of the piece of paper. And then I drew all the way through elementary, junior high, high school, into college. I was an advertising arts major. Then I just kind of got my, if you want to call it a break, in 1984 in, in uh, the Antelope Valley Press in Palmdale, California. They, they published my first cartoon and the rest is all downhill from there. <laughs> so you got your big break. And today, how many newspapers are you in? I don't know the exact count, but enough that I can still make a living off this. Uh, you know, all the way, you know, we got papers all, well, all over the world, actually, but specifically, I mean, you want, uh, I'm thinking like Modesto, Fresno, Sacramento, San Luis Obispo. And Lee, you just don't do the comic strip, you also do some speaking engagements as well. That's correct, I speak all over the country. Uh, it's really, really fun to get in front of a live audience because they're not gonna fake it. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to hear the live laughter. It's like, I feel like I'm sharing a, an evening or an afternoon or whatever, sometimes a breakfast, <laughs> with, with people that are all laughing at what I'm saying, but not at me. <laughs> we asked Lee how he begins his creative process. Coffee. coffee. <laughs> Lots of coffee. Uh, and, and then I sit down and then I sketch and then I race and I sketch and I race until and, something hits me. And do you have uh, family members that are your, uh, your test case to make sure it's funny or you're the person, you're the final person that, that looks at that and sends it off? Well, I'm the final person, but my wife gets first crack at it. <laughs> and the, the basic rule is that she says that's sick, it gets published. <laughs> there is a special reason why we sought out the children's garden at the San Luis Obispo Botanical Garden. Well, in 2017, I received an email from a, what turned out to be a theme park designer who also lives in the county and was a big fan of my cartoons, and he thought it would be a really cool idea to populate the children's garden here at the San Luis Obispo Botanical Garden with some of my cartoons. And I thought, well, that's really cool <laughs> on permanent display there. I, I have something like somewhat of a legacy somewhere. And, exactly. And so we, came up with these various cartoons. They're mostly bunnies, but I snuck a few cows in, one in a bunny suit. And they, it, it took a while, but they, they got them all on these permanent, really, really high quality permanent uh, aluminum backing with Mylar covering. And here, they're here for you to come and see and laugh. Lee has a special project in the works. A television show? That's right, we have a television show called Drawing Inspiration where my co-creator uh, and partner on the show uh, go behind the scenes and interview people that have other interesting creative jobs, whether it's uh, <laughs> art or music, technology, medicine, agriculture, doesn't matter because there's an interesting story behind everything. Absolutely. It's, uh, it just had its premiere in Portland, Oregon, and it took a really, really good uh, review, and we're very happy with that. Well, that is fabulous. And for our viewers that want to learn more about Rubes, where can they go? They can go to rubescartoons.com. And I can't encourage them enough to do that because you can pretty much slap your comic strip on just about anything, right? I'll put it on anything you want. <laughs> That's awesome. And those comic strips are pretty funny. My, one of my favorites is I love is the steamed vegetables. Uh, you can pretty much, I mean, I think everybody can find something because it is funny. It is some funny stuff. Well, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lee, thank you so much for having us out here today and sharing a little bit about the industry you're in and the uniqueness of California cows maybe being utilized in your comic strips. Well, well today for sure. <laughs> for today for sure. California cows. But I do travel around and there's cows everywhere. We don't want to exclude. It's all about inclusion. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody in the herd. Absolutely. Well, Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it.
Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources, valley agriculture, and native wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our table. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture. Valley PBS is committed to teaching children the importance of agriculture. Valley's Gold Education Through Agriculture offers lessons for elementary school students. To download free worksheets and activity kits and to watch child-friendly videos about the crops explored on Valley's Gold, visit valleysgold.org and click on Education. <laughs> 